Okay, great. So, um, Joanne, um, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Great. So I'm going to call upon um, Steve Gordon to introduce um, the members of his team, and then I'll ask Joanne to swear you all in for the testimony today. So, Steve? Yep. Well, it's a pleasure to uh, see you all, or at least see Kevin right now. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to share with you our presentation today. I'm going to make it some introductions, and uh, I would uh, ask you all to just raise your hand and wave to Kevin and the group. So first is our CFO, uh, Andre Bissonette, who's in the chief seats behind. Uh, chief Operating Officer is Ailey Pedersen, Ailey. Chief Medical Officer, Kat McGraw. Chief Nursing Officer, Jody Stack. And Medical Group uh, uh, Medical Director, uh, Dr. Uh, Sheehan. So that's our group. Great, Joanne, if you could swear them in. Would you all raise your right hands, please? Do you swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Yeah. Super, and if I could just ask everyone who is not speaking to uh, place themselves on mute so that uh, we can uh, clearly hear everything that uh, the team from Brattleboro has to say. So, um, Steve, take it away. Okay, um, can you all see the presentation on your screens? Yes, we can. Great. So the um, uh, first component of the presentation is really where we're at and what we're projecting for the rest of the year. I will tell you, it, um, it was a very, very difficult first five months for the hospital uh, where we encountered about a $2.4 million loss. We were very, very concerned. Uh, volumes were down. They had not uh, uh, come back from uh, what we thought we would see as a rebound from the uh, pandemic to this fiscal year. Um, so, uh, thankfully, with a lot of hard work by the folks in this room and our medical staff and all the employees here at the hospital, um, we um, got back into the black uh, with gains in our third quarter, uh, which you see here is $400,000, um, and we're projecting uh, fourth quarter to be another positive of about $200,000. Uh, but we are, however, projecting a loss of about $1.8 million for fiscal uh, year uh, 21. Um, we based our budget um, for um, FY 2022 basically on our um, uh, fiscal year 19 uh, levels, which you see in the last bullet. Um, but obviously, um, you know, as we came out of the pandemic and the first uh, wave, um, this hospital provided a, a huge resource to our community for uh, both vaccinations as well as uh, testing. Over 20,000 uh, COVID vaccines were, were given uh, during this time period and over 15,000 vaccines. We're seeing a very substantial, uh, I'm sorry, tests. We're seeing a very substantial increase now in our testing. And we'll say that uh, we work with uh, uh, AHS in uh, developing uh, the model contracts for both the CIC bro testing as well as the vaccination uh, uh, program and work with Todd Dulles, um, uh, who's the attorney for AHS. Um, patients felt very welcome to come back to the hospital, um, and I think that really helped us uh, regain our um, our, our uh, volumes um, back in March. So next slide, please, Ailey. So this gives you a little graph of what um, was happening since October. Um, we were all, as I said, including the board, very concerned about what um, happened in those first five months. You know, if you projected out based upon the first five months, what we were looking at, that would be an over an $8 million loss. Um, you know, going back to 2020, um, if we hadn't gotten about $11 million worth of federal monies, both as um, through COVID as well as as being a safety net hospital, we would have posted an $11 million loss. So the party was kind of continuing. Uh, for those first five months, but uh, thankfully, with a lot of hard work um, and our uh, vaccinations in our community, uh, we started to see a major uptick in our in our volumes, which meant more revenue for the for the hospital and uh, more care for the patients starting in March. Um, next slide, Ailey. 
So one of the things i um, uh, share with you, and, and there's a lot of detail behind these numbers, um, a lot of it is confidential, but share with you, we really focused um, um, in uh, December uh, timeline as getting a, a back to budget plan, which would have a really a major impact um, on getting us back on track to the tune of about $4 million, both savings as well as revenue enhancement. And, you know, in general, it, it was everything from um, uh, the uh, uh, medical offices uh, and each physician and uh, associate provider seeing 16 patients a day as a goal uh, to your senior leadership team here taking a 10% uh, reduction in our salaries. Contracts were uh, renewed with major um, renegotiated with major providers and a significant number of physicians were put on hold basically because of our lower volumes that we saw in the first five months. Um, so that was a major focus for, for this group and, and our board um, early on in, in uh, really the November, December, uh, January timeline. Next slide. So I'm going to ask um, uh, uh, Jody to spend a little bit of time on talking about contract labor spend because, as you might recall, uh, our last presentation, um, our biggest budget buster, like most hospitals, was the cost of contract labor. And Jody's done a phenomenal job um, in reducing that, as you can see by this chart. Um, but we're starting to see an up uptick um, uh, in our contract labor. But I'll let Jody take it from here. So this uh, shows fiscal year 2017 through what we are projecting for fiscal year 2021. So you can see um, a steady decrease, almost $1.8 million in fiscal year 2017. Um, the light blue at the bottom is for nursing contract temps, and the dark blue is for non-nursing. So that would be um, lab tests, MRI tests, uh, physical therapy, things like that. Um, it's important to note, I think, the $242,000 that we spent in fiscal year 2021 is largely in the last quarter. So from July of 2020 to July of 2021, we didn't have any nursing contract temps. Um, we did bring some in over the summer, mostly to ensure that our staff was able to step away and take their vacations. Um, uh, but we are seeing an uptick into the fall. The contract um, agencies that we work with are seeing more open positions and increased bill rates. Um, so we are seeing a trend um, back up and we'll be focusing on that. Do you want to talk about nurse residency? Yeah, this is really reflective of uh, many different initiatives, um, both on the recruitment and the retention side. Um, so for recruitment, this is our third year of doing an RN nurse residency program. Um, so that's where we bring um, a cohort in in July. It's above and beyond um, our current staffing um, model. Uh, they take about three to six months and they'll work in our progressive um, care unit. So it's very focused education, even more important in the past two years um, as they're not getting all of the clinical experiences that they normally do. So we give them a lot of classroom work, a lot of clinical work. They work with preceptors, our clinical nurse educator, um, and departmental leadership. Uh, we learn something new every year um, and I'm really hopeful um, um, with this group coming in. Um, but other retention efforts and recruitment efforts, mm -hmm. we've rebrand job descriptions, um, we do some social media recruitment, retention, we're really focused on education, professional development, communication, um, and we'll be continuing all of those, but I think we need to think even more um, creatively and, um, and listen to the <clears throat> nurses and our, our technical staff on what they're really looking for. Um, thanks, Jody. Uh, I'm going to ask Ailey uh, to cover the next group of slides in terms of access to care and COVID's uh, impact. Thank you. So starting in March, we really started to see patients resume care within our ambulatory practices in a big way. And certainly that coincided with the onset of mass COVID vaccinations. Patients felt safe to return to in-person care. The main drivers for that return of inpatient care included primary care, cardiology, and orthopedics. And that really corresponds with the top diagnoses that we see for patients during this time frame. Number three is diabetes, number two is cardiovascular disease, and the number one diagnosis that we've seen over the last several months is depression and anxiety. And so these are important things to cover in our primary care practices. On the orthopedic side, we saw patients returning 
to surgeries for hip and knee problems that they had long put off. You'll also see here the rise in new patient visit volume. We believe that with the onset of COVID, patients found that having a primary care provider was never more important than it is now. It's really essential to establish a medical home. And so patients who had not had a primary care provider in the past reached out and we helped them get connected to primary care. While the level of new patients has sort of plateaued in the recent months, we still see on a weekly basis that we are scheduling 40 new patient visits per week. Well, what a difference a year makes. When we were here last year, we were sharing with you that over 75% of our visits were being conducted using telemedicine. Prior to fiscal year 20, in our outpatient practices, we were not familiar with telemedicine. It was a new platform. But certainly, uh, the COVID brought on the rise of the necessity of patients having access to telemedicine. Um, during FY20, for, for many instances, it was our only option for providing care. Today, we're right around 18% of our visits being delivered through telemedicine. And there are many benefits to the use of telemedicine. It certainly allowed us for a creative response at a time when we had no other options to deliver care to patients. And we've really seen that it's been an effective strategy at delivering mental health services to patients. We found that patients have resonated um, in receiving their mental health services through our embedded behavioral health psychologist through the use of telemedicine. But with that said, there are a lot of challenges. And for the reason of the challenges, we don't see telemedicine being our main venue of care delivery moving forward. Um, nothing takes the place of in-person care and where we have the choice, we should be delivering in-person care. We all know that with challenges, with broadband connectivity, that access to telemedicine is not equitable in our state. We also have licensure restraints. Starting in October, clinicians will be obligated to be licensed in the states where their patients reside, where they are receiving telemedicine. And for us, with patients in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, that's costly and takes time. Starting in December, Steve mentioned that we entered into a contract with CIC and Broad Institute to start to deliver mass COVID testing to the community. This allowed patients to come in for free COVID tests and have their results delivered to them in a timely manner. In February, in this very room, we started to deliver mass COVID vaccinations to the region. We were providing over 300 COVID vaccinations per day. And this was through a contract and collaboration with the Vermont Department of Health and the Agency for Human Services. The feeling in this very room where so many hundreds of vaccines were delivered was one of complete joy. Patients were so thankful to come back here on site after months of not coming to the hospital. They felt grateful for being able to receive the COVID vaccine at their community hospital. And staff really saw the return of the COVID vaccine that it personified hope for our community. We all know that the COVID vaccine is our greatest weapon against this virus. And this work continues today. Starting last month, we implemented phase two of our COVID response, which was standing up the COVID vaccination and testing center. Again, this is a collaboration through a contract with VDH and AHS. This is one location located on the campus of one of our primary care practices where we have one team delivering both COVID vaccinations and testing. This model allows us to move in one of two directions. One, to be poised to integrate these services into primary care, or two, should the need arise, which we all believe is pretty likely, that we will need to go back into a mass vaccination center to deliver boosters to patients in need. And so keeping this team intact allows us to pivot back to that model seamlessly. During this time, BMH has really been the backbone for the community, partnering with the Vermont Department of Health, with state and, and local agencies to deliver these essential services. And it's been our pleasure to, to do that and to offer that to, to the community. And we look for your support and helping us ensure that we can continue to deliver these essential services. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. McGraw to talk about our immunization mandate. 
So as you uh, may have heard last week, we announced that we are going to have a requirement for vaccination um, for all of our staff by October 1st. And this is something that we came to after quite a bit of thought. We, as uh, Ailey has just outlined, really embraced the vaccine around here with vigor. It was really celebratory and um, it really required a, essentially a full court press from our staff to be able to do that. Um, and given that level of involvement, people have been very enthusiastic about the vaccine. It really seemed the next natural step with respect to that. Our clinicians have been concerned from the beginning about uh, all of the patients getting vaccinated. And so extending that to our staff was important. At the time that we made that announcement last week of the decision to move forward, we had a staff vaccination rate of just over 90%. Um, we have done outreach since then to uh, all of those um, staff members, letting them know about the uh, vaccine and the new requirement. We will have religious exemptions or medical uh, exemptions. Um, but we do know that some of those uh, folks with requirements have started to actually get the vaccine themselves. Uh, so our numbers we expect will be much higher than that at the end. For those who are not gonna go through with getting a, a vaccination, um, we have had to reckon with the fact that there'll be some difficult uh, discussions. Um, those who are having a medical or a uh, religious religious exemption will require to have some routine testing to ensure that they remain COVID negative. So I'm going to um, have uh, Andre uh, go through some of the financial implications uh, moving forward. So Andre. Yeah, so our, our NPR FPP um, increase for budget to budget is 3% and our overall charge increase is 5.1%. Income statement, I know it's pretty small. Um, I circled some of the high notes, uh, the biggest ones, uh, as you talked about in the earlier presentation with um, Steve Magenic, 340B retail programs. Uh, we've got a, uh, an increase mm -hmm. there. We've contracted with some additional pharmacies, as well as leveraged uh, new 340B tech, which we put in place over a year ago. Uh, so that's, um, that's gaining some results for us. And then our two biggest line items um, that make up 75% of our overall expenses are salaries and benefits. Um, so you see the increase there. And then um, in the financial statement, you've got uh, drug spend. Um, in 2021 budget of zero and 22 budget of 5 million. Um, that's kind of a little bit of an accounting well, slash classification shift from uh, other operating expenses. Uh, so overall, when you combine those two, it's a slight increase, but I just wanted to highlight that there was uh, a variance in, in how we uh, presented those. Next slide. On the balance sheet, um, you'll see some significant changes in the net property, uh, plant and equipment. Uh, the 2020 actual is 25 million. Uh, we're anticipating in the 2022 budget, uh, completing our Ron Reed are pretty close to completing our Ron Reed project. So that's been capitalized. So we see the increase there. Um, the middle uh, circles are, are other third party settlements. Uh, we, have a, we have gotten a Medicare advanced payment of roughly $6.3 million. Uh, we're in process of paying that off and that will be paid off by the uh, 2021 budget cycle. Uh, and the last one on the balance sheet is long-term liabilities. The increase there is um, uh, the drawdown of our bond for the Ron Reed project uh, that we're engaging in, uh, anticipating that that will be um, fully activated by the end of 2022. Charge request, um, again, other operating and other non-operating revenue. Uh, the budget to budget uh, change is the increase in 340B retail pharmacy. Uh, again, we've uh, realized some additional uh, pharmacies, which um, has added to those revenues. And our expenses, again, wages and contract medical specialists, uh, benefits make up 75% of our overall expenses. Uh, the other two items that have increased are drug expense. Uh, we've got cost of drugs, which are always increasing. And we have some additional volumes in our oncology program. Uh, that's been a program that through the pandemic really hasn't seen any volume changes. Uh, as far as decreases, we've actually seen some increases in those that area. And then med surge supplies, um, our volume and our joint 
replacement program has increased. Um, so those are the, the two other expense areas that we have seen some, some increases. Uh, and then again, the change in charge request is 5.1%. So I'll cover um, some of the risks that um, you face, which are probably pretty similar to most of the hospitals. And I'll just point out some that aren't. Um, so obviously COVID-19 resurgence, um, starting to see greater positivity in the area. Um, but, you know, as I've said in the past, for the last 10 years, um, you know, we are the only Medicare dependent um, uh, designated hospital in the state at this point in time. And uh, that designation is set to expire, uh, not this September, but next September. And that really, um, I, I always sound like a broken record when I'm talking about this, but that is our, Medicare is our biggest payer. And uh, we're always very concerned about changes in that um, uh, program. Hopefully with some of the um, movement in Washington, that could be like critical access or Seoul Community Hospital to be considered a, uh, uh, a formalized uh, uh, program that's baked into Medicare uh, on an ongoing basis, as opposed to continually looking at sunsetting this, this program. There are only a, a couple hundred of hospitals throughout the country that are considered MDH low volume hospitals. Um, uh, you know, as Andre talked a little bit about uh, one care risk-based uh, performance, I know Steve Magenic talked a lot about that. We won't uh, go into that uh, to repeat what he talked about. B40B, Andre's talked about um, loss of provider-based uh, billing um, uh, to off-campus uh, uh, facilities. Uh, we will have one of our uh, offices in uh, Putney considered um, uh, a uh, reduction in our uh, provider-based billing. Um, the other practice, which is in Brattleboro off campus, will be coming on campus uh, once the Ron Reed uh, Pavilion is uh, is built. But that is still a risk. Um, and then, as I've talked about in, in prior um, uh, presentations, um, this hospital is very committed to our community um, on a number of different levels. Uh, uh, vulnerable population nurse, care coordination. We are a major sponsor of a, um, a dental uh, program uh, combined with our uh, United Way, uh, serving uh, those on Medicaid as well as those that have no insurance. It's been an incredibly successful program. Um, embedded behavioral health therapists in our primary care and, and our community health team. Um, so um, I've always been asked the question, well, when are you going to see improvements uh, related to um, these kinds of programs? Uh, and, you know, we're, we're on a journey of five to 10 years. This is not something from budget to budget. Uh, you can really look at and say, well, you know, we, we had X number of patients who uh, were diverted from, uh, let's say, the uh, ER to the dental uh, uh, program. It's a lot longer process. Um, and for all of these, but this is a commitment that this hospital and our board has to our uh, community. Um, on the flip side is opportunities. We uh, see continued opportunities in, our, in revenue cycle. Uh, we have a relatively new VP. Uh, for our revenue cycle uh, programs. Um, we've been very successful. Um, Ailey and the medical group, Dr. Sheehan, have been incredibly successful with um, uh, new uh, clinicians joining the staff. You see them here. Uh, we will have our first surgical podiatrist uh, coming on board uh, this month, uh, and we continue to recruit in, in uh, both primary care and the surgical specialties. Um, uh, opportunities to continue to work with our regional psychiatric uh, strategy group, which involves the retreat and HCRS, our designated uh, agency here, um, and uh, with the Assertive Community Treatment Initiative, ACT initiative, uh, which we are currently seeking funding for. Um, continued collaboration, uh, obviously, with Dartmouth and with uh, Cheshire. Uh, we have multiple programs that are um, partnered with both uh, DH and Cheshire, starting with the emergency department. Uh, pathology, radiology, uh, cardiology, pathology. Did I miss any, Ailey? Rheumatology. Uh, rheumatology. And pulmonology. Yeah. So um, uh, very strong. We continue to look at the um, that evolving strategic partnership uh, to continue to grow. Uh, telemedicine. Uh, Ailey talked about. Uh, we did implement a, a new platform, a more effective platform for us. Uh, and then what's really important for us, as it always has been, is the LGBTQ plus uh, initiative now combined with our racial diversity initiative and the hospital um, hired its first DEI director uh, this past month. So we're uh, very 
again, committed to that, and we see continued opportunities as it relates to uh, DEI. So I'm going to flip it back to uh, Ailey to talk about value-based uh, participation with OneCare. So when it comes to OneCare, BMH is all in. We're all in for all major payers for which this program supports. And we have selected to be part of OneCare because the values that are, are funded through OneCare and idealized are ones that we also hold true. This includes um, a real focus on preventive medicine and primary care. And that's really what our hospital is all about. So some of the models and payments that OneCare helps support that we appreciate include the access to embedded care coordination. OneCare provides the vehicle for payment to help support and reimburse the care that comes through embedded RN care coordinators. These are nurses who are committed to providing and meeting the psychosocial needs of our patients. Additionally, um, OneCare has funded a few unique and innovative programs for us. One is our cardiac prehab program. Our hope and objective is that one day this can be turned into a waiver program where insurance companies reimburse us for services like this. But this is taking your cardiac rehabilitation program, which meets the needs of patients post having a heart attack and flips it and works to be geared towards identifying patients who are at high risk of having a heart attack and then stopping that heart attack in its tracks through exercise and education. So it's really focused on improving the quality of care and decreasing the cost. We have selected to be part of OneCare and to be part of the advanced alternative payment model for several reasons, but I'll highlight the top three. One is the continued support of the community health team. Steve mentioned our commitment to that, and that's a commitment to patients. This is a free service that's provided to Vermont patients, and without the OneCare vehicle, this funding would not exist. Two is timely access to data. Given the unique relationship that OneCare has with insurance companies, we can get data that we would not be able to receive through other means, and we get this in a timely manner. So I mentioned earlier our top three diagnoses that we've seen over the last several months. That's data that we got from OneCare. Um, without that OneCare mining that data and giving it to us, we would really be hard pressed to have the data that we need to make important decisions around the quality of care and utilization. And lastly, something that I don't think it's talked enough about, but I think is really important, which is because we're part of an advanced alternative payment model, OneCare is responsible for the federal requirement of our MITS reporting, the Merit Based Incentive Payment System. Without OneCare doing that extensive, rigorous reporting for us, it would mean our staff would need to do that. And that's taking staff's time away from important patient care initiatives to, di to divert to doing this. And so there are several reasons why we're all in with one care, but I wanted to make sure that I highlighted a few. And I'll turn it over to Andre to talk about our capital budget. Yeah, I think this is our last slide. Um, this is our capital proposed capital budget for uh, FY22. See, it's 2.6, just under $2.7 million. Um, broken down by the four major categories that we have there. Um, the CON approved modernization project is the Ron Reed project. Um, the construction is to finish in October of 2023. Um, the boiler plant upgrade has already been complete. Um, we do not have any additional CONs um, teed up uh, at this point in time, uh, but the, uh, the non-CON capital again is just under $2.7 million. But we have asked for an extension on our uh, approved modernization program. Uh, the program has not changed in scope, but obviously we have significant delays through Act 250, and then we delayed uh, as we went through um, uh, COVID. So um, I know one of the things in front of you, I don't know when you'll be able to rule on that, is a uh, uh, request to uh, extend the project as, as well as an increase in the dollars approved for this project. So that concludes our presentation for this year. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to go in um, alphabetical order, starting with board member Robin Lunge. Robin. Thank you. Um, and hello to the Brattleboro crew. Good to see you. Um, 
So I have a couple of questions. So one question I wanted to ask you about is on your slide 14 and also in your narrative, you mentioned uh, limited patients with the long-term population health investments. And I think um, it's always good to remind folks in general that this is that these sorts of investments aren't a one year return. Um, so that's helpful, but I'm curious whose limited patients you're referring to. Are you seeing that in your staff, in your within the hospital, in your community? Like who yeah. who's don't, don't take in it, patients? Yeah. Don't take it personally, but I'm referring to the Green Mountain Care Board. <laughs> okay. I I wouldn't because take I, it personally. Uh, under 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 prior uh, uh, prior chair, I, we were asked a couple of different times. Well, when do you expect uh, returns on these investments? Is it a one-year deal? Is it a two-year deal? No, we're we're talking a five to ten-year deal. Great, thank you. <laughs> um, in terms of your recruitment, it sounds like there's good news around some successful recruitment efforts. And could you just remind us? I know I remember in the primary care area. There are a number of retirements that you had mentioned last year. Are you seeing um, your openings driven by retirements, pandemic related? Um, you know, FBMC was saying that they feel like they've had some success uh, because folks are looking to move to Vermont. Could you just give a little more qualitative information about that? Yeah, I'll let Ailey and Dr. Sheehan might want to address that. Absolutely. So, and is there a way that you could turn your camera back on too, Steve, so we can see the oh, yeah. people responding? That'd be great. Oh, there you yeah. go. There can you go. see us now? We can, yes. Thank okay. you. <laughs> great. So our primary care clinician recruitment um, has been somewhat been driven by retirement, but it's one of those fields that's important to perpetually recruit. Um, as I mentioned during the presentation, primary care is an important service for us, it's important to our community, and sort of as the heart and the foundation of what we do here as part of our hospital. So we've had you know, a few retirements, but I wouldn't say that's the main driver for it. Um, on the other hand, in terms of our, um, you know, the ability for us to recruit clinicians, we've had more clinicians reaching out to us uh, as opposed to us searching them out than we have ever had. Uh, clinicians are very interested in moving to Vermont. They see us as a safe state. They have been really responsive to all of the safety initiatives that we've had in place here, and they want to be part of that culture. So from a clinician recruitment standpoint, um, it's, been, it's been great because people are seeking us out to want to come here and be part of this. Yeah, I will say, Robin, I think what, probably what you're referring to is it was several years ago, we had three independent primary care physicians retire all at the same time, very, very little notice. And that was 6,000 patients from those three full-time uh, um, docs um, uh, that we had a really hard time placing. We couldn't place them. Um, so uh, Ailey and Dr. Sheehan and the medical group leadership, clinical leadership, have really focused on continually to recruit um uh primary care both mds do's and uh nurse practitioners and physician assistants great thank you um and my other question um was relating to the first healthcare advocate question um as mike fisher mentioned uh, we have been trying to collect this uh ratio between um uh, related to Medicare, and I believe I can see if I can find my tab here that that was a a question that you did not answer. So I think uh, to Mike's point, I think we do have to figure out a way to start being able to make these apples to apples comparisons. So I wondered if you could speak to that. So, Robin, you're talking about the, the original questions with the, um, the, the DRP weights? Yes. Yeah, um, that is something that we, we have not historically captured. Uh, it is something that we can look at doing um, for future years. Okay, but do you have a general sense of it, even if you cal do you calculate it in a different way? You don't sort of use that as a metric at all? We don't really use that as a metric at all. Okay. 
Thanks. Um, and I think in interest of time, I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. Uh, next we'll go to board member Tom Pelham. Well, thank you for a crisp uh, presentation and uh, uh, hopefully we can bring this in for a landing before one o'clock, but it looks like we, we will. I just have a few brief questions. Um, my first one is just an, an observation. I mean, last year we talked about the provider tax and this year I'm happy to say that the um, across all hospitals are all coming in um, at, uh, at a plus or minus 6% of their uh, 2021 um, projected uh, uh, net, net, net present revenue. And um, I think that your presentation um, comes in near the high end this year uh, at 6.53%. And I, I'm just wondering, is there something magical about that number? Uh, because if it were to drop down to say 6.1% or so, you'd have uh, a few hundred thousand dollars uh, falling uh, to your bottom line and enhancing your operating margin. So I'm, I, I just, uh, um, you know, other some hospitals in are 5.8%, 5.9%, many are right at 6%, and you're at 6.53%. It's just a suggestion to, um, uh, to uh, make your operating margin appear uh, stronger than it might otherwise be. Um, unless there's something sacred about that 6.53%. Um, so that's just an observation. In terms of uh, fixed perspective payments um, on the, uh, on the uh, income, state, in, in income statement, you have that at $13,892,894. But in Appendix 6, it calculates out for a 12-month period at $13,745,000. $160 for $160 for a difference of um, 147,000. And there again, I'm just wondering you know, which which number is the one that we should look to. Um, but overall, uh, either one of those numbers you use, it's about 14.5% of your NPR FFP, um, which is just about average across hospitals for the state, at least given um, you know, the, the recent numbers, uh, you know, Southern Vermont, uh, as, as, as you know, is up at the highest in the state at 24%. So I'm just wondering, do you have any kind of conceptual game plan as to how far you would want to grow your fixed perspective payments um, as a, as a uh, percent of your, your total revenues, your, your uh, net, net present revenues, F FFPs? Well, I would think that our, our, um, our game plan would be to maximize that as much as possible. I like Southern Vermont or Southwestern Vermont. We're in Medicare, Medicaid, uh, and the commercials uh, as well. So it comes down to attributed lives and how those lives get attributed to Brattleboro um, in our um, health, care, health service area. Um, I, 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 don't know the magic to get to 24% versus 14% with attributed lives. Um, other than um, uh, the, the location that we're at and other hospitals um, that patients could potentially go to to attribute to another hospital. Mm -hmm. So what I hear you saying is that you don't think you've plateaued. Uh, what the horizon looks like, you can't. You you, you can't. Uh, you you don't you you don't have a uh, a specific trajectory to get. To get to some future future number, I do not know, and I don't yeah. I don't know if there's any way to uh, you know the, the magic of attributed lives is different for each yeah. payer, yeah. Um, and, and um, you know being able to identify and, and quote unquote redirect those uh, patients yeah. to a, a hospital is, is not something we look at doing. Yeah. Well, but the reason I ask is I just I know at the board we're trying to figure out where the tipping point is, um, you know, where where the level of participation in these value-based programs uh, gets us to the point where we, we truly are generating um, the uh, innovations that, that the system promises. And uh, as we saw with Southern Vermont this morning, that's also a risk, um, you know, so it, there's, there's both sides of it. And um, <clears throat> I'm just hopeful that, uh, um, you know, 
we keep we 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 keep uh, growing that number. Um, uh, I'm looking. Can I answer a little bit on my end? You know, sure. uh, strategically, with what I've been talking about with Medicare dependent hospital designated status, always a question mark. Um, we do want to drive towards more value based um, uh, 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 payments. Um, that is for us a more secure way of uh, sustainability for this hospital, uh, as opposed to every year wondering from our biggest payer how much we're going to get paid. Um, so we're very different than every other hospital. Um, and as I said, MDH um, is slated to go away next September. Um, that's a very uh, concerning um, uh, uh, situation for us because MDH gives us how much more? On the, and low volume, four, four million. Four million dollars with low volume. That's a lot of money. So uh, that's why we have from day one um, been in value-based payment through um, uh, through one care. Uh, um, that's unique. You will not find that uh, with the other hospitals, whether it's critical access, sole community, which is what uh, South, uh, Southwestern is. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, my, I only have two more questions. One has to do with payer mix. Um, and again, I went in and kind of trended your, your different payer mix categories, you know, gross, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and, and um, commercial from the, from 19, uh, from 2019 through 2022 uh, budget. And um, I noticed that your, the growth rate for Medicare uh, is 9.1%. Uh, the growth rate for Medicaid is 10.4% over that period. Um, and the 20 for Medicaid, the 2022 budget over the 2021 projected budget is a 71% increase um, in Medicaid payments um, uh, going from 7.7 .7 million to 13.1 million. Um, and commercial is down at a negative um, Two tenths of uh, of one percent, and it just uh, I, I'm just um, asking what insights you might offer as to that kind of specific mix uh, of of of, of, pay, of payer mix. So let me uh, when when uh, Springfield uh, Hospital shut down their uh, OB program, um, we got the uh, majority of uh, OB cases coming out of Springfield, which is a significant number of those on Medicaid. Uh, so that was um, a pretty big factor as well as other um, uh, specialties um, that uh, uh, Springfield did not have. Um, so that, uh, and as you, as you know, um, Medicaid uh, uh, makes up a, a very significant portion of our OB volume here in Brattleboro. So that's a, that was a big jump. Yep. Yeah. So with, with Springfield having come out of bankruptcy, do you see um, a, a migration of, 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 of services migrating back to that hospital, or how do you see that relationship unfolding? Uh, you'd have to ask them. You know, I think once you lose OB, it's pretty hard. Um, you know, <laughs> we lose four million dollars for an OB program. That's both inside the hospital here for our birthing center, as well as um, the OBGYN practice here. Uh, we we staff an office in Springfield. Um, on the campus of Springfield Hospital. Um, I don't think, you know, personally, and you're gonna have to ask Springfield this, but I don't think they're gonna be interested in taking on a $4 million loss when they just came out of, out of, uh, uh, out of bankruptcy. Um, we, you know, I would like to see enhanced payments out of Medicaid for, um, uh, for OBGYN. It is a significant loss uh, for this hospital, but it is a major service uh, that our board wants to make sure we have in this community. And you as the Green Mountain Care Board want to make sure that there's not a bigger OB desert in southeastern uh, Vermont. Uh, we're the only one left standing right now in our area for, for uh, uh, OB. Uh, mm -hmm. that, is a, that is a huge driver both on the Medicaid front as well as the, you know, when you start looking at services on the loss front. So, but we are committed to do that. But uh, we'll be asking for additional help from AHS um, on at least the Medicaid uh, uh, front for OB. Mm -hmm. And my final question yeah. is, um, 
uh, I think it's Appendix Six or Seven, uh, the one that profiles your your um, <clears throat> you know, your payment for the Medicare Advanced Repayment Program. And as I followed it, you um, you have at the end of 2020 there was still a $6.3 million liability and that that is liquidated in 2021. Is that is that the right understanding? Um, partially. 2020, yes, we did have that balance still. Um, Medicare started recouping those funds in April of 2021. Uh, there's a 12 month run out for that recoupment at 0% interest. Uh, once the 12 months is over, unless they change anything, um, the interest rate, I believe, is like 18% annually. Uh, at that point in time, if there's any balance left over, we will send them the, the amount of the balance. Right. And so, and so then the, they won't be deducting it from, your, from their payments to you anymore. Correct. Right. So that's my questions. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Tom. Next, we're going to move to Maureen Yusufer. Maureen? Uh, thank you. And thank you for your presentation. Um, just to talk a little bit more about um, where Robin was going with and, and where the healthcare advocate has been asking about the ratios between Medicare, Medicaid, commercial, and the payer. Um, you know, I'm kind of creating a proxy based on the information that everyone's sending us. And, you know, we have in the details um, your gross to net for each of the payer types. And uh, it doesn't break it out by inpatient and outpatient, but um, for those hospitals that calculate, like Southwestern, the calculation works out very closely. So um, you may not have those materials in front of you, but it's the data that the staff provides and you, you provide to the staff. So for your, in, for your data, your Medicare ratio of gross to net is 38%. So what the gross charge, right? And then what you actually get, you yield 38%. For Medicaid, you yield 34.2%. And for commercial, you yield 58.3%. And then you just index those. Medicare is one. Medicaid becomes 0.9. And commercial becomes 1.53. So, I mean, it is a way to use as a proxy. Um, and what it helps us do is look at you know what that ratio for your commercial is to to Medicare, and so because it's very hard to look at you know the price pricing across all the hospitals, you know it, it is a way to kind of at least say how does that benchmark. And the only other hospital we've seen today is Southwestern, and you know they were at 2.1 for commercial compared to their Medicare, you're at 1.5. So you know it just just kind of positions things. I mean it, it's not. Um, obviously, there's a lot of different spending and, you know, what you're doing in, the, in, in Medicare, Medicaid and commercial, but, you know, it is a way to index. So I know I'm doing that for each of the hospitals to kind of at least look at that as a benchmark uh, for those hospitals that aren't. So just want to make sure everyone's on the same page as to what I'm doing. And um, I guess, you know, Andrew, could you speak to that as far as does that make sense? Yeah, I think that does make sense and it'll be probably different for those hospitals, for every hospital actually. Um, you know, that's a pretty drastic difference between us and Southwestern, which is the, exhibits the difference in our, our um, reimbursement models. Um, it'll be very different when you look at it with a critical access hospital, which yeah. is probably reimbursed and all but two of them are, are uh, only in Medicaid, they're not in Medicare and commercial for the ACL. Um, so I think between our MDH, which gives us enhanced reimbursement for Medicare, um, and the um, you know that we're all in with the ACL, I think the 1.58 um, ratio for commercial makes sense. Okay. So well, I think the question I would have is, what's the end game? You can't really change your payer mix. It's your what's in your community. You know what I'm saying? So if you, no, want to, right. if you want to give us, you know, an extra percentages for charge increases, that, that's fine. But you've got to go back to the basics is the payer mix reflects your community, right? No, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Payer mix is another right. critical piece. If you're, if you're a hospital that's 70% reimbursed by commercial, you know, your payer mix versus 30%, you know, that that's obviously a big difference. But yeah. um, 
you know, I, I just think it's a data point when you're looking across hospitals, but there are a lot of factors that then would go into yeah. any decisions right. being made there. But right. um, okay, just to, to talk some about reserves on your balance sheet and, you know, just trying to align with um, when I look at the, it looks like the ACO reserve you have on your projection for 21 is a million and carrying that through to the 22 budget is also a million and just wanted to understand um do you know what your settlement is going to be in september as we you know as we saw with southwestern they're obviously getting some favorability back this year and and just how is that reflected in your projections um and in your reserve yeah so our Settlement in September will be for 2020. Um, overall, we've got uh, an AIPVP issue with payback to Medicare. Um, so we've got some money in there for that. The reserves that we generally build here um, are based of our maximum risk with all three payers that were involved with the ACO. Um, so as far as um, getting any payments back, uh, we were favorable with Medicaid. Um, and then with the AAPVP, it's unfavorable with the Medicare. So overall, it's going to end up being um, probably a, a, a pretty significant hit to our reserves. I'm thinking, I think, if I remember correctly, it's like six or seven hundred thousand dollars with that AAPVP payment. So is that reflected in, you know, anywhere in here as far as your because your, your reserve of a million is just kind of carrying over from the prior year, but should you have a net hit to that, you'd have to replenish that reserve. So are you assuming that six or seven hundred thousand? Um, yeah, as we're for some of that we're replenishing through 2021. Okay. Yeah. And then on other reserves for um any any COVID CARES money, anything that's still on the balance sheet that you may actually be able to to move, um, not hold as a liability? No, we took all of the CARES Act funding into um, down into the PL last year in 2020. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the only other thing that's on, the, on there is a liability is the Medicare advance payment. Um, um, not, oh, and the AIPVP uh, grant fund that we got. We got a million for that. Did you that get any? That, that won't be brought down to the bottom line. It, any PPP loan money, and is any is that all resolved? No, uh, we did not qualify for that. We have uh, we had too many headcount for that. Yeah, too much headcount. Yeah. Um, okay, great. And now for 2021 on the income statement. Um, it looks like you're going to move from what you were projecting to be a $4 million loss to a $1.8 million loss. Is that correct for operating income? That is correct. And how should we think about that favorable $2.2 million as we roll forward into 2022? Uh, it's going to help you, obviously, in your cash and other other pieces because that wasn't considered when you did your current forecast, correct? Correct. Okay. Well, I, I shouldn't say correct. It was the, the forecast carried from 2021, no, but the budget piece for 22, yes. Uh, and then um, I appreciate the 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 chart talking about the 4.1 million in revenue enhancement and expense reduction plan. And I guess a couple questions. One, can you talk about how much of that you've already accounted for in 21? How much of that will be incremental in 22? Um, and are there any additional plans for 22, a, a 22 financial action plan? Well, I'll, you know, from a high level, um, on um, most of the position holds, since our volume has come back, uh, we have now recruited for those positions. So that that's that was a savings in the, uh, for this year. Um, we have uh, contracts, uh, vendor contracts that uh, we re renegotiated pretty significant uh, rate reductions, um, and uh, that will roll forward. It is already baked into the budgets for um, uh, 22. 
Um, in terms of visit volumes um, uh, expected by the medical group, um, that you know, 16 a day has already been baked into the budget for um, uh, 2022. So it's kind of a mixed bag. One time hits uh, or one time uh, uh, um, actions that really reflect that really were taken in 2021. But a number of these are obviously rolling uh, forward for us. And are there new actions for 22 that you can talk about and additional cost savings and efficiency that you're looking to achieve? Well, I, I think one of the, the biggest challenges um, um, that we face and is what's what's going to come with contract labor um, that Jody talked about. Uh, that is, the, that is um, you know, the biggest concern I have and I think we, uh, our group here, um, we're, we're recruiting for a number of open positions right now. Um, I sent to Kevin some data uh, from one of the firms that we've used. They can't fill contract labor positions. So that's probably the big, uh, a bigger concern that, that we have here. Um, but we're in a constant state of vigilance in terms of what, what savings every position, whether it's budgeted or not budgeted, is reviewed by senior leadership uh, before that position is uh, turned loose. So we continue on a daily basis to look at our operations, um, but there's no, um, you know, I think the key is we got to also be nimble enough to respond to what's going on in our local community as it relates to uh, the pandemic and and uh, uh, any resurgence of COVID. So we've got to, you know, stay pretty uh, flexible, but uh, we're we're doing what we need to do every day. Okay, um, thank you. That's all I had. Thank you, Maureen. Next, we'll go to Jessica Holmes. Jessica. Great, thank you. Um, the good part, Kevin, of me going behind everybody is that a lot of my questions have been answered. <laughs> but um, can we just speak a little bit to the the um, projections on NPR or the you know the budgeted uh, 2022 NPR relative to 2021 projected and 2019 actual? Um, so for 2019 actual uh, net patient revenue and fixed payments, I have here for about 84 million. Um, for the 2021 budget, as submitted, I recognize this has been adjusted. It was about 93 um, million, but the projected was 87 million, right? So there's a deviation here between what's what you budgeted in 2021 and what's been projected for 2021. Um, and so I recognize then that the 2022 budget is 96 million roughly. So there's a 3% jump from 21 budget to 22 budget. Uh, but if we use the projections from 2021 as submitted, it would be about 10% increase. And so I'm wondering if you might, first of all, update the 2021 projected NPR. So we really have a sense of really what is the projected, updated projected NPR to the budgeted 2022 NPR. And then speak to going back to 2019, the actuals are only about 84 million. So 84 million to 96 million is a pretty big leap. And so I just want to make sure I want to understand some of the uh, thoughts behind those, those jumps. I'll, I'll start with the, the projection to budget jump. Um, if you recall, um, I forget which slide number it was that Ellie went through when we had the first uh, five months of our year where we were we had lost two point four million dollars. Yeah, um, remember when we when we actually do the initial projection and budget for this is the March April time frame. Sure, so no, I totally understand. Yeah, sorry, yeah, go ahead. You, you you the that number and going from projection to next year's budget is basically taking. You know, starting to see our, our volumes come back and then benchmarking the volumes back against 2019's volumes. So what would you say right now is the 2021 projected, knowing that the volumes have come back, would you still say, I mean, you know, you went from a $4 million projected loss to a $1.8 million projected loss. So what is the equivalent, the, you know, the now new projected NPR for 2021? I've not calculated that. Um, I don't have the number off the top of my head, Jessica. I'd have to go back and, and take a look at that. 
Okay, I think that would just be really helpful for us to understand then, you know, given what you're seeing now, you know, what you're projecting out for the end of 2021, presumably it's not actually going to be a 10% jump from 2021 to 2022, but I'm trying to get a sense of what that actual number is. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, it'll, it's That's probably, okay. yeah, probably going to be close to our 21 budget off the top of my head and don't hold me to this. They're probably saying the 90 million compared to the 92 million for the budget. Okay. Okay. That's helpful. Um, and then my second question, actually, and this is something I'm really just trying to understand. Uh, I asked SBMC the same question. I'm really trying to unpack these changes in charge requests, uh, particularly, you know, into some component parts. And, you know, as you, you submitted some information about inflation, so the inflationary factor seems to be about 2% for uh, Brattleboro. Um, based on your submission of sort of the breakdown of wage inflation and supply inflation and drug inflation and all that overall weighted, it seems to be about 2%. So the charge change in charge request is 5.1. So we can see that one, some component of that 5.1 is clearly inflation, um, which makes sense. I, as I mentioned in the earlier uh, hearing, I, I think about changes in charge as having to reflect not only the inflation, but also cost shift because the public payers are not reimbursing, right? And then a need for margin. So I'm wondering how you might think about the 5.1. Obviously, 2% is, is clearly accounted for by inflation. How do you think about the rest of that change in charge request in, in terms of justifying it? So the change, yeah, I, I, it's all connected, like you said. Uh, the change in charge request um, does come back to, like you said, we're not going to get much out of Medicare and Medicaid from that change in charge, so it falls to commercial. And then that that then flows down through to cover inflation, any potential volume increase um, related expenses, um, and then to maintain a, a margin, um, and our margin for next year is 0.65%. Um, so a majority of that change in charge is to cover inflation. But inflation is only 2%. So 2% of the five, I mean, you know, we know what inflation is. So I'm trying to get from the two to the five, right? Uh, the, the 5%, yeah, the 5% is gross. So then when you net it down, you're at, roughly two to three percent increase in our NPR. Okay. Yeah. And net it down largely because of the cost shift, right? The fact that not everybody is not all payers are actually gonna right. <laughs> pay yeah. the plan. Yeah, we're not gonna get that two to three percent or much out of that, if any, from Medicaid or Medicare. Got it. So okay. That's very helpful. Um, those are my questions, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jess. Next, I'm going to turn to the Healthcare Advocates Office for their questions. Oh, uh, sorry, Kevin, I wasn't keeping track and <laughs> caught me off guard. Um, no questions from, from the chair, huh? Um, thank you, Brattleboro. Um, uh, I guess maybe first, uh, let me ask you to um, uh, I, I I heard your recognition of your DEI director. I think you called the position. I'd love to hear you expand a little bit more about uh, what that position, what your goals are for that position, and what uh, what you hope, what they're working on. Sure. Uh, you know, we started uh, our LGBTQ plus council several years ago, and uh, we um, um, worked with uh, the Fenway Institute in Boston. Uh, we did major training of all staff here at the hospital, uh, and at that point in time, um, we actually brought on a DEI coordinator. Um, that individual uh, actually um, has gone to AHEC, um, and this organization made a determination that it's such an important position um, that we made it a director level uh, position. Um, the individual uh, who we hired um, is um, uh, Gail Summers. Uh, Gail joins us um, uh, from CNS Grocers, is a you know pretty big employer, um, and um, we're pretty excited that she has now come on board. And one of the things that um, I think she um, has a high on her list of priorities is 
we have the LGBTQ plus group and we have a core group, which is Council on Racial Equity. Um, and being a small hospital, how can we work together and how can she serve both um, uh, entities um, while at the same time being effective? So she's right now kind of just getting her feet wet. She came on um, just about, what, three weeks ago? Um, so uh, that is one of the, the, the key points here. And then the other piece of her role right now is getting to know um, folks in our NAACP, the other folks in our local community representing the BIPOC uh, community, as well as um, uh, at the state level. Um, she also is going to connect with Dr. Avila, Maria Avila, who we've all taken uh, training from uh, here, who's done excellent programs. Um, so it's that's kind of the start right now. Um, and it's really to, the position really is to make those connections with both our, our local community, uh, the BIPOC community, the LGBTQ uh, plus community, as as well as on a state level, Mike. Thanks. Since you mentioned it, uh, um, do you have a sense of what percent of your your leadership or your staff have have been able to take that Dr. Av Avila uh, training? Well, I've gone through twice. <laughs> you get so, to count twice. <laughs> you try to get it right. Um, but the entire is that a remedial <laughs> class? <laughs> yeah, really. uh, I, I enjoyed it so much. Um, I think the last one was uh, the previous one was through the Hospital Association, um, and then um, I forget the group that AHEC. sponsored her. AHEC sponsored her. The entire senior leadership has gone through, and um, in terms of um, uh, uh, we've done a lot in terms of um, our staff here in terms of training um, as well. And I think it's an ongoing, I can't give you a number per se. We do have now modules, uh, training modules within our annual training program through HR that people have to take. Um, so it's part of their employment. And that's part of Gail's um, focus is how do we continue to um, disseminate um, uh, um, information and, and being a more responsive organization to both um, uh, the BIPOC community and LGBTQ+. Great, thank you. Yeah. I have a question or two about your free care. And well, I think really just about your free care uh, numbers from 1920 and projected 21. Um, if I'm doing the math right, it, it looks to me like in 19, as a percent of your gross patient care revenue, um, you have a relatively high free care. Um, you had a relatively high free care. You were actually one of the leaders in, in having um, um, a high amount of free care um, at 1.19 percent. If I if I do that same math in 21 projected, it, you fall pretty much to the bottom 0.47 percent of go gross patient care revenue. Um, what happened? You know, what do you think's going on? Well, uh, a lot of times the free care gets triggered from patients coming into the hospital and actually reaching out, or we're reaching out to them as they come through, uh, capturing them as a, a self-paid patient and helping them start the process and helping them through the process of the free care application. Uh, what we saw through the pandemic was uh, the, the patients weren't coming in, so right. that became a disconnect and outreach to that population became for us very difficult. We are seeing an uptick uh, in the free care. Again, this, we could just told Jessica, you know, we put this together back in March, April, um, when our volumes are still down, we were still not seeing the volumes come through. That's since changed and we're seeing more applications being done uh, and, and being signed off on. So I'm hoping to see that that continues. We'll see how uh, things go with uh, our current resurgence, but um, we may have to, you know, uh, reevaluate how we reach out to patients if we go back into a resurgence. And patients aren't coming back into the hospital because those num those dollars will just sit there over time. And and what I've seen um, in my past history is if patients have bills out there. <clears throat> sometimes they just won't come in for care uh, for fear that you know they haven't paid their bill and it just. Uh, becomes a, a moral decision for them, um, and I don't like to see that happen. Yeah, th thanks for saying that. Um, that's the story we hear as well. Um, well, that's why I, I did it as a percent of gross 
gross patient care revenue because I recognized that that you had fewer patients through the pandemic, and uh, so I was trying to normalize it for that. I, I guess I would just ask that you um, pay attention to it because it it there's something going on um, that's I I have no way of um, evaluating, um, but you, you know as a percentage of your of your gross patient care revenue, you you went down significantly and um, and I, and I don't know exactly what you have to do in order to stay at a relatively level. We, of course, would want you to go increase, um, but to at least maintain. Yeah, anecdotally, Mike, the other thing that um, I can see happening is a lot of these, these patients that are self-pay who haven't been working uh, and, and haven't come in may also qualify for Medicaid. Um, so we may see a shift from free care to Medicaid um, and again, that's anecdotal, um, but I can see that actually happening uh, in the next next uh, probably six months. Um, so it's something we need to keep an eye on. And I'll ask our navigators to start tracking that and see if we see an uptick in, in Medicare enrollments, uh, which may go back to an earlier question of ACO attributed lives down the road. So, you know. Yeah, um, I just echo what. Eric said in the last hearing, um, you know, to the extent that you're interested in taking a look at your policy, um, we would be happy to partner in that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Next thing we're going to open up to public comment. Does any member of the public wish to offer comment on the Brattleboro Memorial Hospital submission? Does any member of the public wish to comment? Hearing none, um, it's almost a minor miracle. I was so paranoid that we'd never be finished by one. And uh, here we are um, looking like we're ahead of schedule. And so I will ask one question, um, Steve, and start by uh, thanking you and your team for um, being here today. I know that You've been asked a lot and you were asked to do more at the end of last week and and uh, you know you agreed to uh, go forward with your hearing today which is uh, really uh, very helpful and it it helps us to understand your story better but the the one question that I'm going to ask only because I like bringing the story around to Ron Reed and I tell so many people about this story and and how somebody living within their means can, if they are prudent and, and uh, thoughtful in their investments, really can um, create a, a little bit of a nest egg. And so the way I'll blend this all in together is to ask you, um, well, first I'll confirm that yes, we have had some initial conversations about your uh, request concerning your CON and uh, we're working on that as uh, fast as possible. Um, but my question is, um, given all the stories that are out there about the increased um, costs of doing any type of construction whatsoever, um, are you feeling any of that or were you locked in enough that uh, um, you won't feel any of that pain? Well, I think um, if you look at our budget um, uh, for the project, you'll see some of that pain in there. It's, uh, I think we're budgeting about $700,000 of, of additional costs of just the unknowns. And the unknowns are focused around um, um, PVC, um, sheetrock, um, labor costs for the contractors. But thankfully, we locked in uh, pre-pandemic to the major items such as steel, HVAC, um, um, uh, 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 heavy equipment, and all of our equipment for the ORs, which is the major driver for this project, those three ORs, the replacement ORs, all of that had been locked in with POs. So um, I think a very substantial portion of this project has already been locked in to really minimize the risk. But there is a risk out there, and that's why you'll see, as you look at the, the budget that we, we've submitted, is an additional $700,000. Uh, um, I will tell you, you know, it, as you know, it's been a long journey when, back four years ago when we first presented this uh, project. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we haven't had any scope increase in the project. It is what it is. 
It always has been, um, but it's these delays that have really um, uh, uh, hampered us, whether it was Act 250 or whether it was the pandemic. But I think we've done the best we can. Um, you know, we look at, I looked at it um, a little differently that if we had, um, if we had a 4% increase every year in just costs in general for this project, it would have been about a $28 million project. We're bringing it in now at what, 20, 26, 27 million. So we're a little bit ahead of that, that, that game. Um, but I, I do appreciate the patience that you all have had. Um, my patience is worn pretty thin on this. Um, but you know, you go back to sustainability. Um, this is such a critical project for this hospital because we've got to have new ORs uh, uh, to maintain patient safety as well as to recruit all the, the, the uh, physicians that we have been able to recruit as well as and, uh, you know, bring back to campus primary care um, as well. So it is a critical piece of the, the puzzle for Brad O'Barrow's future, uh, which I think you saw when you initially approved this project. So. Um, it's a long answer to a short question. <laughs> so I never know where the noise is coming from when we're having these uh, teams meetings, but I did hear a little bit of a construction uh, noise. Is the, the project going smoothly right now? Yes, you know, you never know what you you know, what you find out, but you know, we, we uh, one of our uh, challenges was um, as they were doing the footings, um, they found um, a lot of sand. Um, um, uh, for the project, and that hit us for about, I don't know, $250,000 of uh, increased expenditure. But we, once you come out of the out of the ground, we get our footings, the steel is up, um, all of the, uh, you know, the, the siding is, is being installed right now. Um, so it has gone very, very smoothly um, as, as we kicked off this project, actually in September. We delayed this project until last September. Um, because of, uh, uh, of COVID. And it's never been an issue of, do we have the money? It's been an issue of, you know, the governor's emergency uh, um, uh, orders. It's been um, uh, the, the board saying, let's wait until we get through a little bit of this pandemic. Um, so now it's, it's uh, full steam ahead um, with hopefully a complete completion date uh, a year from now. Um, uh, so we're excited about that. Great. And just in closing, uh, uh, I did want to uh, thank you for uh, mentioning once again your collaboration with a, a nearby hospital and um, actually several because you, you, you've you talked about Springfield, you've talked about Cheshire, and that's really something that uh, really has to be part of the solution for Vermont healthcare moving forward. And, and you've been a leader in that. So um, thank you and thank you to everyone on the team for the presentation today. And um, we'll be back to you with our decisions in September. You got, you got one hand up, Kevin. Oh, I do. <laughs> Dale. It's Mr. Dale. Sorry about that. I had my mouth full and I was not gonna raise my hand while I was still eating my salad. Um, <laughs> can you give me a quick rundown? You, I, I thought I heard you say the OBGYN was, um, not profitable for you either. It costs more than um, you bring in. Can you, can you elaborate on that a little more? Is it we have yeah. such a low, low birth rate, or what's going on? What's going on? I have to get in. That's me. Sorry. All right, you're chiming, Dale. You're chiming. So um, I don't know any hospital that really makes um, uh, uh, profit on OB unless you're doing probably 3,000 deliveries, and you can spread your fixed costs over that. There, this is a this is a very fixed cost, um, significant program, um, both in terms of the physicians, in terms of midwives, in terms of the nursing staff, um, and um, as I said, you know our numbers are fairly. We're below 300 uh, births. Um, and um, uh, to spread those costs over a Medicare reimbursed, Medicaid reimbursed program um, is a big problem from a financial standpoint. So you are you are not going to make um, uh, money on OB. I don't know many hospitals that make money uh, in this state on OB. Potentially the ones that are bigger programs, uh, but there aren't that many that are over probably you know a couple hundred, um, uh, maybe. Um, 
uh, UVM, which also has neonatal uh, services, which wrap into OB, uh, but is not one of the leading uh, uh, profitable services. But it's much more of, as I said, um, uh, a community service. And if we don't do it here, there's gonna, there is a big OB desert um, in southeastern uh, Vermont. Dale, that follows up uh, um, really uh, my words to the team in Brattleboro about the collaborative effort that they've undertaken by, they call it being a, a, the lone person in the uh, desert for delivery. But on the other hand, if multiple players were doing that, um, the losses would be greater because you would even, even have less of an efficiency. And if these cases had to be sent to Dartmouth, it would be more expensive care. Yes, so uh, Brattleboro, it really uh, is to be commended. And um, just confirming what Steve said, Dale, that um, nobody's truly making money when it comes to, to bursts. And yet we expect as Vermonters that we will have that care and we should have that expectation because we want to, to have births and we want to uh, uh, make sure that uh, we don't have any further population decline. So, yep. yeah. Um, I, I, could I ask one other quick question? Is what is sure. the main reason that is driving down our birth rate? <laughs> well, it's a, drop, it's a drop in population of uh, folks having, uh, having births. Um, it's a major uh, drop in the, the, the pandemic. Um, this isn't, uh, you know, a one or two night um, a lights out uh, um, situation. It's a, a long term issue and people are very concerned about um, um, their economic status and are delaying, I think. But I think much more of it is related to the population. Um, and, the, you know, we get we in Brattleboro and in Wyndham County, it's one of the oldest counties in the country. Uh, getting older every day, so what you know, we just aren't attracting uh, the younger um, uh, uh, folks, and that trickles then down to um, deliveries. That's what I was after. Thank you. Yeah. If it was social, economic, or just the demographics in this state. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Dale. Enjoy your salad, Dale. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so with that, we'll uh, close out this hearing and. Um, could I have a motion to adjourn from a board member? So moved. Second. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.